We're delighted to be joined today by Yasmin Laroche. Yasmin is the Deputy Minister for Public Service Accessibility and is working on implementing uh, the Accessibility Legislation Accessible Canada Act. It's really exciting to have you on. Uh, we're delighted to hear about what Canada's doing. It's been um, great to see Canada going on an accessibility journey and actually leading the way on some of this stuff. So um, really very happy to have you here. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who you are, what your role is within the, the within TBS and a bit about what TBS is as well, please. I'd be delighted to. Thanks, Neil, and thanks so much for inviting me to, to join you today. This is awfully exciting. It's an honor to uh, to be joining Access Chat, uh, who you do such cool work. And uh, it's an honor for me as a Canadian public servant to be able to share a little bit about what we're doing in our country. So as you mentioned, uh, the government of Canada has introduced a piece of legislation it's called the Accessible Canada legislation. Uh, it's also known by its numerical title, Bill C-81. And it's currently working its way through our parliament. And in fact, the bill is currently in front of our Senate. And we are really hoping that this bill will come into effect later this spring. When it does, it's gonna have huge implications for people with disabilities in Canada because the bill is going to actually allow the government of Canada to set standards and regulations in seven different areas of, um, of, 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 our, of the economy of the country, in areas such as the built environment or employment or uh, procurement or information and communications technology. So it is, uh, it's very comprehensive. And it covers um, what we call the federally regulated sectors because Canada is a federation. We have a federal government, we have provincial governments, and we each have our own areas of responsibility. So the bill is going to cover uh, sectors like banking, broadcasting, telecommunications, transportation, and where I come in, the public service because of course the legislation will affect everything that we do as a, as a government. And, and my role, I was just appointed to it last August, is to design a strategy to help the Public Service of Canada get ready so that we can be leaders with respect to this piece of legislation. And why I'm at Treasury Board, Treasury Board is like the management board for, uh, for the Public Service and it uh, creates policies. It, it actually um, manages our relationship with employees. And so it's the logical place for me to be uh, given, the, given my mandate and the mandate of the organization. So that's a little bit about the legislation and a little bit about what I'm doing. Fantastic. Um, and, and we're excited to learn more about what that means for society. We've also seen previously uh, about uh, how some of the, the provinces have been implementing accessibility. So we, we, we've heard about the, uh, the AODA, the accessible, uh, accessibility in Ontario, etc. And I know Antonio has also got a, a question, so I'll hand over to Antonio. Thank you, Neil. Uh, 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 something that that's, uh, we, are, we are observing in Europe is that sometimes governments they put out their legislation on disability, but then uh, the implementation on the side of the government is not as what is expected. So can you tell us how it how accessible and what type of work you're doing in order to make government itself accessible and inclusive for, for public service with disabilities as an example? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Antonio. You were breaking up, so but I think I understand the question, which was um, what are we actually doing to make things different for public servants as a government of Canada? Is that correct? Okay. It is. Uh, our, our government becomes accessible uh, itself. That's a great question, and that's at the heart of what I'm being asked to do. So, as I mentioned, the legislation covers seven different areas. 
one of the things that my team and I are doing is looking at establishing a baseline. How are we doing right now in those seven areas? So I'll give you an example. Employment is one of the key areas in uh, the legislation. So when we look to how, what is the experience of public servants with disability in the Government of Canada, we have, we're really fortunate in that we do um, an annual engagement survey of public servants. So we have very rich data uh, in terms of how, uh, how our employees are, are, are feeling, are experiencing the workplace. And what we've learned from this survey is that public servants who self-identify as having a disability report um, disproportionately higher rates of harassment and discrimination and much lower levels of engagement. We also know when we look at uh, career progression data and promotion rates for public servants with disabilities, we find that those rates are a lot lower than for their colleagues. The third piece that um, I would highlight is uh, representation. So right now, if you look at representation rates across the federal public service, uh, it's approximately 5.6% of our population who self-identify as having a disability. Our recruitment rates uh, are about 3.3%. And we have almost double that rate of people leaving the public service. So we know that you know, there, there's some kind of an experiential issue happening. And we're trying to understand what's at the heart of that. Um, it's hard to pull that kind of uh, information from uh, an employee engagement survey. So we've done uh, a lot of focus groups and workshops with employees with disabilities over the last few years to try and understand a little bit what's behind that. And we think one of the biggest challenges is actually the way we approach what we call in Canada workplace accommodation, uh, which means, you know, uh, so I use a wheelchair, I have, you know, I need uh, a desktop that goes up and down so that I can access it easily. So that would be the type of accommodation that I would require. In the UK, I think you call it adjustments. We have a very decentralized approach. Uh, it is up to every hiring manager to say yes or no. And in most uh, departments and agencies, it's up to each hiring manager to also um, pay for the adjustment. So one of the areas that we're really looking at is how can we make that experience more seamless? How can we make it less cumbersome for both the employee and the manager? How can we simplify it and streamline it? So that's an example of something concrete that we're hoping to be able to do over the next few years. Um, my colleagues uh, at the Public Service Commission are developing an internship program that is specifically going to target Canadians with disabilities to bring them into um, the Canadian Public Service uh, for a two-year uh, internship opportunity which gives uh, people who might not have considered careers in the public service a way in. But I think also equally as important, it gives uh, departments and other Government of Canada organizations an opportunity to work with people with disability and, and kind of maybe demystify what, what that's like. So I think that's a really encouraging initiative. Uh, that's just a, a couple of examples, Antonio. Um, we are still working on our strategy, so I don't, I can't go into a lot of details yet because we're we're in the consultation phase right now. But we are hoping to come out later this year with something we call a public service accessibility strategy that will cover off all of those areas that I mentioned that are in the legislation. No, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, in other areas, you know, uh, like in, in the digital sector, uh, where when government is leading the way, it would uh, impact the, the way our, our business and the private sector end up ad adopting technology. So it's so I, I, I strongly believe that by doing that within government, it will also inspire the public sector to move into the same direction. And now I, I will leave this back to Neil Lever. Well, welcome to the program. We're really excited to what you're doing, what you're doing in Canada, and we've been seeing 
for years, uh, Canada years. take a lead on this, especially yeah. with Ottawa, because I know that y'all had legislation before about accessibility that we from the United States felt had a little bit more of an impact than some of the stuff we were doing here in the US. And so I would be curious about all the different things you're doing. And I love that you're considering it from so many different aspects, from procurement, employment, the built environment, the public service. That seems to be um, broader conversations than we are seeing in other countries. So I applaud you for those efforts. Um, I am curious how, um, you know, I know how we do it very messily here in the United States. We sue each other, but how how are you um, expecting um, people to respond to this? Do you think they will really get on board and they're going to do it? Because, because some cultures are like that. They're like, well, this is the law. Uh, we're not like that in the U.S., but some cultures, especially Asian cultures, are really good about if there's a law, you know, they're going to try to, you know, make sure that they uh, adopt the law and do the right things. And so how do you how do you encourage your fellow Canadians to to really do this so that people are not accidentally disenfranchised? Uh, thanks. That's a that's a great question, Deborah. So as you pointed out, the legislation is really comprehensive, and um, and it's my colleagues in the Department of Employment and Social Development who are responsible for the broader legislation and particularly how it's going to work with the, some of the sectors I mentioned: the banks, the telecoms, the broadcasters. What I can say is that there's been extensive consultations, both in the lead up to uh, the, the legislation. In fact, um, it was a six month exercise and we like to say they're possibly the most accessible consultations that the Government of Canada has ever done. Like they were amazing in terms of all of the different kinds of interpretation that was available. Um, very, very well done. And, and of course, uh, at every stage of the legislation, there's an opportunity for stakeholders and other interested parties to come forward and share their views. Um, I think, may, I, you know, I'm speaking for myself, I think most people would agree that we want a country where everybody has equal opportunity, uh, where everybody has an opportunity to work, to uh, use transportation systems, to get around and to participate fully in society. So I, I think it would be hard to find people who would disagree with that. Uh, and in fact, what's interesting to your point about how people are going to react, as I've been looking at what could we do better or differently inside the public service, I've been meeting with people from the private sector and I've been really impressed by the work already underway, for example, in some of our big banks. So it's interesting that we are creating legislation and, uh, and we as a public service really want to do well and we, we want to show leadership. But I do feel we already have a lot to learn. Um, and you know, I was just in the UK, I met with Neil in person uh, last fall. The UK has done some really interesting work, again, within its civil service, uh, in terms of uh, making a more welcoming environment for civil servants with disabilities. So we, um, you know, Canada really believes in diversity as an essential element of who we are. But I think we also recognize that we have a lot to learn from the experience of others, both other governments, but also uh, the private and not-for-profit sectors. And, and I, I agree with yeah, what you're saying. First of all, about what you're saying coming out of the UK, we see a lot of leadership coming out of the UK, and I'm very impressed with what they're doing. But I also want to agree with you that your not only your banks, but some of your other corporations, I know that formerly I was working with VMware, uh, BlackBerry, um, you know, can't, you can't have this conversation without talking about TD Bank or Scotia Bank. So we've already been seeing quite a bit of leadership come out of Canada and also consulting groups that support disability inclusion and accessibility coming out of Canada, doing what they're doing in Canada, but bringing it to the US and other parts of the world. So we've seen for years leadership coming out of Canada. So 
it's very exciting to watch now what's happening because you're setting the bar very high for you know countries like mine where we haven't done as good of a job with what you're talking about you know one thing we i mean we've done so many things right in the u.s but we you know we created our americans with disabilities act which will be 29 years old this year we created our rehabilitation act and our 19 in 1973 and amended it 508 which is our law um, we've you know done it with the standards but we still are really struggling especially when it comes to employment and so we've had some we've had some great successes but there's a lot that we in the United States can learn from countries like Canada and certainly countries like the UK and and I think that Neil wanted to join this so Neil I don't know if you want to add on before we turn turn it over or if I just hand it to I'll let you decide you Neil? Okay. Neil? Okay. Neil, you're on mute, sweetheart. Neil, you're on mute, sweetheart. Here you. Can you hear me now? Can you now? No, you can't. Yes. Yes. Okay, because yes. I I seem to have been double muted. Both on my on my speakerphone and remotely. Okay, so I, I was all I was going to say was that we know that the civil service in the UK is doing a good job amongst their own people. Uh, we know that they're good at. Um, putting together employee resource groups and stuff like this and and there is great dialogue and great advocacy within uh within the UK civil service and there have been some really standout programs to like access to work um what what we're now seeing uh, is the the need for the next step and that is really to um to to from an employer point of view to de-risk the employment because there is still this perceived risk that if you employ someone with a disability there's going to be additional cost additional effort and all these kind of things uh, and it's not just about the money it's about the paperwork and the complexity so what we're, we're hoping um, that we can bring together is some kind of joined up approach to this and there was a great report recently written by uh, Liz Sace who was a former head of um, Disability Rights UK um, called change I think it was called um, changing the focus switching focus um, which which was looking at how you might help transition people with disabilities um, into work with support from government which of course is sustainable for society and um, now, Yasmin, you and I have talked before about sustainability and linking disability, accessibility to sustainability. Well, if we want our societies to be sustainable and growth to be sustainable, we need to include everyone in society. So I think that some of this stuff that's coming out of um, London School of Economics um, from people like Liz is really interesting. Um, so, so how do you, does, does Canada have a plan for helping um, the private sector de-risk some of this stuff because it's okay to legislate but um, how do you support? Or is that That's a big such question? a great question. <laughs> That's a great question and I'm not going to be able to answer it in a lot of detail. Can you hear me? It's telling me my audio has been muted. Okay, good. Um, because that's really the, the bailiwick of my colleagues at uh, employment and, uh, and social development, because what you're asking about is what can government do to facilitate uh, a smooth transition and access to employment uh, more broadly? And I can say that the legislation does, um, does look at that because employment is one of the key pillars. And my colleagues are looking at, so what are the instruments that the government can use to support employers to, uh, to be more proactive in terms of hiring employees with disabilities. 
And I can certainly uh, go back to my colleagues and get you more information on that. What I can talk about is what we're doing internally. And the Government of Canada is the largest employer in the country. So what we do does make a difference. Uh, there is, um, I mentioned the internship program. We have a, we have a summer student program which uh, is targeted to uh, uh, post-secondary students with disabilities. And again there, the idea is to bring students in, to give them an experience in the public service, to learn what it's like, and to work with managers and departments, again, as you said, to kind of de-risk the experience and, and provide them with, a, with tools and tips to help them create a more, uh, a more successful work experience. Because our, our idea is that if students experience uh, a wonderful summer employment opportunity, then maybe we can hire them when they graduate, which would be awesome. The internship program is also intended to do that. We're also doing something really interesting. We're doing a pilot project with an organization called Live, Work, Play that um, specializes in facilitating employment for people with cognitive um, disabilities, and uh, I'm, 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 I think we've already had about 92 individuals placed, and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, program. It's very uh, supportive, both for the hiring employer, but also for the employee, and, um, and it's doing very well. Now what we're trying to do is see how might we scale this, uh, this project, because it's, it's one firm, uh, mostly based in Ottawa, and we're trying to see, you know, well, how do you make this actually scalable? But I think the biggest way to de-risk is to actually put a big focus on recruitment. Um, I think we probably need to do a better sales job, a marketing job as an employer, that it's actually a great place to work, and that we, and that we can create welcoming environments. But I still agree we, we need to do some more work internally um, in the UK, you use the term becoming a disability confident employer. Uh, in Canada, in the government, we're introducing the concept of becoming an accessibility confident employer. So putting the emphasis more on the employer and, and how confident are we that we're creating accessible and inclusive. So that is, um, that's part of our strategy as well. I have a quick question about the internships. Uh, I, there are a lot of internships that I've seen all over the world, and often they're not paid, and they don't, unfortunately, often they do not lead to employment. I know it's not always practical for them to be paid. I understand that, but I think it's very discouraging for our community when they, you know, because I, I, I have a daughter with a, a cognitive impairment. She has Down syndrome, and uh, I talked to a lot of family members and they say you know we did everything our our loved ones showed up to work and they did everything that was asked and then there was no job and I know we can't guarantee always employment outcomes but it's so frustrating for the community of people with disabilities when we try to follow the rules and then there's nothing for us at the end I know there's no way that you're going to do it that way in Canada because you're so smart and clever in Canada but it's just something that when I hear internships I'm always curious about would tell you know I'd like to understand more about that part of the internship. Well, the first thing I would say is that we don't do unpaid internships in the government. Um, all of our positions are paid. So whether it's this pilot project dealing with people with cognitive uh, impairments, they are paid. These are public service jobs, and they are paid as public servants. Our summer student program, uh, they're all paid. The internship program, they will be coming in as, you know, probably entry-level positions, but they will be getting paid. Uh, I actually joined the public service many years ago uh, through uh, a targeted recruitment program for people with disabilities, and I was paid an entry-level salary. And um, and so I, so on that point, um, Deborah, for sure, we we pay our people. I think the other point of your question is a really good one, though. Once you get somebody in the door, um, the trick is then how do you retain them? And I guess the only answer I can give to that is we'll have to see, um, you know, because we're just starting. So, but that will be one of our measures. 
So coming back to my strategy or the strategy that we're developing around accessibility, one of the keys to it is having a really good, um, we call it a results measurement uh, framework. So you know, what is it that we're actually going to measure? And one of the things that we're going to be measuring is, uh, is representation. So I mentioned we're at 5.6%. Well, what if we were to try and get that to 7? And it's not just getting it to 7, let's say, or pick another number. It's keeping it there. So for me, that's the trick. It's one thing to recruit people. But the real measure of your success, I think, is can you sustain that? Can you, can you actually uh, keep people uh, by making sure that they're having uh, a valuable work experience? I, I, I want to make one more quick comment, and then I'm going to pass it to Neil, because I know he has a comment. But first of all, bravo. And, bravo. and second, I, I would like to say, the person that is being the intern, they also have the responsibility to come in, be there, do everything. You know, sometimes I also see the opposite effect of the, the some members of our community just expecting because you got these programs, I'm going to come and I'm going to get a job no matter what. And that's not the way the world works. We, we have to, you know, we have to stand out sometimes from our peers. We have to prove, you know, that we, we are, you know, somebody to, you know, we, I just, the point I'm making very poorly is that there is responsibilities on all sides, not just on the government, but bravo, bravo for the leadership. And, um, yeah, I know wanted to make a comment too. Go, go ahead, Jasmine, if you want to make a. You, you Can I just, yeah, I just wanted to respond yes, quick. Please. Yeah, just very yes, quickly, please. Deborah, because I'm laughing because um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Um, you know, I, I yes. love Astaire and Rogers yes. uh, musicals. And one of my all time favorite quotes, and it's one that I use all the time to describe how it sometimes felt for me as a woman with a disability in the public service. So Ginger Rogers used to say, this is a quote at least that's attributed to her, um, well, I did everything that Fred had to do except backwards and in high heels. And I love that expression because I think sometimes when you are a minority, you do feel that way, that you, know, you, have, to, you have to be better than everybody else just to be treated equally. Um, I guess what I'm hoping, since I'm at the tail end of my career in the public service, is that for the next generation of people with disabilities coming in, uh, that won't be the case. That, you know, that we treat everybody equally and we see everybody as having the same level of potential and ambition, and that we don't try and make people with disabilities to be either superheroes or objects of pity but that, that public servants with, with disability can, can have the type of career that they want. And that's my biggest hope. Excellent. Um, I've just remembered Remember. what my comment was. I was sitting there thinking, oh, I was sitting there thinking oh, goodness me, you know, goodness me. this is great. Deborah's just got one little comment and it just comment. dropped out of my brain. And what it was was actually around the fact that you said that you, you're setting targets um, and, and, and you've got some ambition to, to, to you know, increase those, which is great, but it's not all coming through recruitment and it's not all coming through retention either. Actually, some of this is about self-identification. You've talked about self-identification before, but actually this is key to the success of all of these programs. And we're not talking about disclosure because disclosure sounds dirty. It sounds like we've done something bad. Um, so, so this is something that we're trying to move away from because it, 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 there's something about disclosure. It's like, I've got a dirty little secret. And thank you, Kate Nash from, from my purple space for, for sort of enlightening us on that one. Um, but we know within our own organization where we've got, um, we're setting ourselves ambitious targets that we're not going to achieve them through uh, through recruiting, even though we will be undertaking recruiting recruitment programs. We're not going to achieve them just by retaining the people with disabilities that we've already got. We've got to get people confident to be able to identify with disability because lots of people would fall under the definition of disability, but are never going to identify with it. So how 
how do you think you can help people feel more comfortable beginning to identify with disability openly? Because they may they may do it um, internally. They may have internalized the fact. They may not at all. They may be in complete denial. How do we change that? Oh, that's such a great question, Neil. Um, I agree, uh, especially if you look at the most recent survey on disability in Canada that just came out uh, late November of 2018, which uh, our statistical agency just released it, and it's, it shows that 22% of Canadians identify as having a disability. So contrast that to the 5.6% I just mentioned in our public service. And I agree with you. I would suspect, um, again, I, I, you can't survey to say, have you self-identified or not, or I, I, perhaps we could. Um, but I would suspect that there are people who do not uh, choose to self-identify. Uh, and that could be for any number of reasons. It could be fear, how is this information going to be used? Is it going to have an effect on my career? It could be a simple uh, feeling that, well, I don't, I don't, I don't feel as a person. I don't feel disabled. I don't feel that my condition is a disabling condition, and therefore, why would I identify? So, I think there are a number of factors that lead to people making that decision. I think one one of the things that we can do as an employer uh, is probably do better a better job of communicating why it's important. Um, so, I think there are some opportunities, some kind of a an, uh, an identification campaign, especially in a country like Canada and a public service like ours where people have multiple identities. And so how can we encourage people to, um, to feel comfortable in those multiple identities and willing to share? I learned something uh, from my discussion with one of our major banks. And they said what really changed things in their own organization was when one of their senior VPs chose to disclose publicly that, um, that they had been living with bipolar condition for most of their adult life. And this was a very, you know, somebody who was perceived to be very accomplished, very senior. And the fact of somebody at that level willing to, 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 to discuss this kind of made it okay then for others to start to be able to have that conversation. And, and I think that's really powerful. So I would say storytelling and people being willing to be open um, can also encourage others. But I don't think there's like a, there's no magic formula. I think it requires a, a whole range of, of actions. Thank you. That, that, that's great. And I'm 100% I'm on the need for both storytelling and role model behavior from the very top. We, we really need positive role models that can um, publicly talk about their experience. We've, we've done some really good storytelling within our own organization in Atos around um, being parents of people with disabilities or siblings of people with disabilities. And, and it was kind of like the dipping the toe in the water for people. So we got some very senior uh, executives that were openly talking about their experiences as parents. My next step, I hope, is to get people to you know, dive in a bit more uh, and start talking about their own personal experiences. Because as you say, um, it's when you get those senior people coming forward and talking about it that it creates that acceptance in the, in the organization below that if they can do it, it's okay for me to do it. Good luck. I've had one piece already. So I'll, uh, our, our, our CIO for Northern CIO Europe, for Northern Europe. Uh, has actually come out and, and, and talked about being dyslexic. So, so that's a, a great start, but we, we need more. That is great. We did, uh, we started it, we did a campaign a few years ago, and we called it the Breaking Barriers campaign. And it was uh, either written or video testimonials by public servants with disability or working with public servants with disabilities who talked about an actual barrier that they overcame. 
and uh, they were very, very powerful. I don't, I, I, I didn't see a spike in, in uh, self-identification afterwards, but it's just important just to, um, as awareness raising. So I, I, I love those kinds of very personalized campaigns. I think it's a great way to, uh, to, to reach a broader audience. Excellent. And um, um, is there anywhere we can see these campaigns? Or is it, are they still on YouTube or anything like that? I'd be very interested. In, let me uh, let, let me see. I know they're on our internal uh, website, so I don't know if we made them available because they were within the public service. So I'd have to find out. I, don't, I mean, we have privacy laws, and I I don't know if when people made them, they were willing to make them public beyond the public service, but I'm happy to find out. And if it's true, then I can, I'll give you a link. Great, because great. I think the more we can share, the better. Antonio, you're about to say something. Yeah, um, you know, government uh, uh, can be really huge. So, so many, you know, uh, many departments, Canada is, uh, as, is a large country of people in different, almost, almost opposite sides of the world. Um, uh, how do you uh, work in the areas of uh, collaboration within government to make sure that all departments are somehow on board and uh, are facilitating accessibility and inclusion in their own regions? You know, to, are, are you doing to uh, online uh, to share inform information on the web on the internet? Are you having regular calls? How do you enable that within government? Thank you, Antonio. That's a great question, uh, and it's true. Canada's big, and as I said, the public service is the biggest employer in the country, and 60% of our public servants are outside of Ottawa, they're across the country, and in fact around the world through our, our diplomatic missions. So um, we have multiple ways of reaching out. Uh, we have lots of different governance mechanisms that are already established. I have my own governance mechanisms that I've created for this strategy. So uh, there's a deputy minister's advisory group. We have an assistant deputy minister's steering committee. We have technical working groups. Um, but I'm also doing town halls. So I'm going across this country to meet with public servants in person uh, and by teleconference uh, to really engage on what do you think of being a, 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 an inclusive and accessible public service really means? What are the issues? What are you doing that's interesting? When you're a huge, uh, diverse organization like ours, it's really easy to not know some good stuff that's happening. So one of the things I'm trying to collect is best practices. Who's doing neat stuff that we can share? Um, because most of the conversations that I have with other senior leaders in the public service is, I'm right there, I'm with you, I want to be involved, please tell me what I can do and please tell me how I can do it. So people really want practical information. So my job and the job of my team is to uh, kind of become that hub where we can share information. We have a, an online presence within our, uh, the Government of Canada where we're posting uh, drafts of the strategy, where we're posting toolkits and best practices and advice, and we're hoping to do more of that. And I'm meeting individually with every single one of my deputy minister colleagues, and in some cases with their executive teams, to talk about what they can do within their own organizations. So uh, engagement is a huge piece of what we're doing because too often people, you know, they write these beautiful policies and then they publish them. But if you haven't done the engagement and the, the socializing, I think it makes it much harder than to implement. So we're putting a huge focus um, we've done an online survey. We had 2,300 public servants responding to it. I, we've, I, we've met with over 2,500 other public servants uh, in person over the same period of time. So we're really trying to make this as inclusive as possible in terms of the way we're rolling it out. Fantastic. It sounds 
so exciting to be uh, at the forefront of this. And as uh, Deborah commented in the in the slide, that socialization is critical. Uh, one of our former guests on Axios Chat, Roy Lilly, ran something called the NHS Academy of Fabulous Stuff, uh, which was exactly designed to do what you're talking about, which is to collate all of the good practice and share it with everything else. So definitely take a look at the NHS Academy of Fabulous Stuff. Uh, we need to close now. We've reached the end of our time. It's been a fantastic and a uh, real privilege to interview you. And, um, and we need to thank MyClearText for helping us with the captions and also Barclays for their continued support for Access Chat. Thank you very much, Yasmin. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. A real pleasure. Love this.